Hello, everybody, and welcome back again to Esoteric Atlanta. I'm joined here with my friend Cindy from, I, I will put all the channel information down in the description box below, but obviously Cindy is from Sacred Garden Yoga, the actual location, and the YouTube channel. And then, of course, we have Emmy from Holistic Genie, um, our little Reiki, our little Reiki master. And it's so, it's so appropriate. I know that um, obviously everything for the most part is divine, even if it doesn't feel divine at the time, at, at the time that things are happening. But Emmy wrote this beautiful for the 60 day shadow work challenge, which we're on day 40 today. So good job, you guys, you are two thirds of the way. 60 days is a lot of days. It's 60 of them. <laughs> like it's a lot of days. And um, we have so many people pushing through it and going through this. And so, um, Emmy wrote a week for grief work, which is a really hard topic to to dive into. And hopefully we can get a little bit vulnerable with you guys in our own conversations with grief. And Cindy has some awesome classes um, on her channel. And we've, we've placed or I placed uh, the exercise as being these hip and heart openers to work alongside the topic of grief, which is what Emmy provided. So they, they work together in a very miraculous way. Of course, again, everything's divine. And if you've been on this channel for a while, if you followed Cindy or Emmy for, or for a while, you know that the body is, you know, very, everything that we carry within our psyche and our thoughts plays itself out in the physical body. And the heart obviously is a big one, but the hips too. I mean, the hips are the biggest joint in the body. And so they become the storage unit of just, you know, that I know, I mean, we've talked about it on the phone before of that junk, that junk drawer, that junk closet you have at your house where you just kind of put something in and shut the door. And that's kind of what happens with the hips a lot is that stuff kind of gets, and it doesn't matter, you guys, you can have very flexible hips, you can have very stiff hips, that's not determining what's really in there. And so um, hip, that's why a lot of yoga classes, you see a focus on hips is because we're trying to unpack that stuff. But before we get into this discussion at hand with our lovely ladies here, I just want to go ahead and share with you guys again, with the shadow work challenge. Um, today, we're shooting this on Wednesday, March 1. Um, you're now two thirds of the way through the through the 60 days. You didn't come this far to only come mm -hmm. this far. You, you're at the tail end, you're, you've got it. The, the hardest part with anything is just starting, like literally. I mean, a daily, the, I think Cindy and Emmy can also, you know, the hardest part of starting your daily practice on the yoga mat is actually just starting it. Once you're in it, you're in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you guys are like two thirds of the way through. So you are going to be doing um, Cindy's class today with the hips and heart and winding. Have a link here. You're picking your meditation. And of course, today is the third day of grief work. Um, and this is guilt and pain are often the most profound and difficult parts of the grief process. We can find ourselves ruminating, frequently thinking about missed opportunities or having remorse for what could have been. Many of us are tempted to engage in escapism or turn to addictive substances or activities to cope. The pain can feel profoundly heavy, like a blanket or coat that we cannot remove. I think we've all felt that, the heaviness of the body. Uh, sometimes we become desperate for relief. It is, a, it is vital to allow ourselves to completely feel all of our emotions, to lean into them and hold space for them and allow them to flow. It can feel nearly impossible to function normally or participate fully in life's activities. The pain in this stage can also be felt in the body as physical pain, weakness, and fatigue. And uh, Emmy has some journaling props. I have some journaling props having to do with uh, the exercise as well in correlation, what came up for you doing these classes. And as you guys know, I picked the same class tomorrow we're going to change it up a little bit for the first three days you were doing the exact same class Cindy's class with the grief work um, tomorrow we are going to change it up again with the bar and then go back to Cindy's work because you guys I do do that in the challenges I'll keep you on it once for a specific exercise for a little bit then I'll change it for a couple days and then we'll go back to see what gets pulled up out of you. And so with that being said, let's just go ahead and dive right into it because this is such a heavy and hard topic. And um, I hope, I hate to use the word safe space because I feel like that word's gotten a little ridiculous over the last three years, but I do hope in all sincerity that this channel and this community is a safe space for people who are trying to work through their humanness, the humaning of them and, um, you know, 
life can be hard. And it's through that friction of grief, anger, everything that we find the light, the light in this, like the more the heart breaks, the more the light can shine through. So I don't know who wants to start ladies. <laughs> Such a heavy topic. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to start now. Um, well, Emmy, why don't you go through quickly, just talk everybody through the stages of grief. Again, we know the people who are doing the shadow work challenge are working through the stages, but what just a uh, cliff notes version, what are the different stages of grief? Okay. So I'm actually in a grief process right now. So my brain is not um, functioning up to par. Can you pull up the seven stages? I like to, there, there are two. Some people talk about five stages. Some people talk about seven. There's no right or wrong. I like the seven because it gives a little bit more definition to, um, some of the, the stages that you can be in. Now, not everybody goes through every stage and it's definitely not linear. It can bounce around, um do you yeah I'm gonna pull up this website here uh that's not on the shadow work challenge just because I don't want to um pull go through all the shadow work stuff but um let's see here so I pulled up I googled, googled seven stages of grief this is showing the five but we can add in the extra two so we'll just look at this here denial so do you, is there anything, I mean, do you want to, is that what you want to do? I mean, you just want to go through these and then we'll add the extra two in. Um, yeah, but what, can I, can I find real quick? Um, yeah. let me just, I should have pulled this up before. Okay. Sorry here. Um, I'm going to give you guys the right to share stuff. Well, while she's doing that, Cindy, what's, um, go ahead and what, what's your perception of grief and, and your work with grief through your own practice and your own life and your own shadow work and, because I think people think well, of grief as really just death. Like the grief is not just experiencing a death. That there's so many different things that can 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 ignite grief. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Is uh, um, grief doesn't just come about, and I think it surprises people, especially when you hear so much uh, um, about letting things go. Right, that's like a, a thing that we hear often, and it's appropriate. I mean, there are certain things that we need to let go of, things that we need to shed, things that we need to dissolve in order to uh, move on to the next phase of our life of our being. And when we say, "Oh, just let it go," you know, but uh, we forget that letting go usually involves a very deep grieving process. And that's why it makes it so challenging to let things go is our willingness to, it's like, okay, well, it's not just the, um, the uncertainty of the future, but it's like the, uh, the letting go of who you were um, in order to become. And I had this experience when I was um, up in Peru, up in Lake Titicaca. And Lake Titicaca is said to be the second chakra of the earth. You know, it's just a huge ass lake. And I, I was love, on the I lake. love the name, by the way. I think that's the best name, Titicaca. Like, I think that is just the most fabulous uh, name ever. Titi, it's Titi for Peru, Caca for Bolivia. <laughs> that's what the Peruvians say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, love it I know but anyways I was uh, um we were on the waters on our, our way to to the place the the resort that we were staying at or the place that we were staying at um in the the center of the lake and uh when we were on the waters out of nowhere I felt this immense desire and this need to cry and I was just crying crying and I don't know. I mean, there was nothing that was happening around me. We were in this beautiful place. You know, I was, I was leading a retreat and everything was beautiful, but just crying. I just wanted to cry. And so I cried and I'm like, what is all this crying about? And it was, uh, it was that it was, it took me a minute to figure out, oh, this is actually grief that I'm feeling. I'm feeling grief for the person uh, who I used to be. I'm feeling grief for the 20 and the 30 year old. As I now step into, I mean, this uh, retreat was maybe six or seven years ago. So I was like in the, um, the probably early 40s. 
but it was the grief of letting go of my 20, 30 year old self. It was the grief of letting go of my beautiful brunette hair as I step into this, this here, you know, like all the things that, that you don't even think that you are going to grieve. And I just felt deeply this, this sense of, well, she's, she's gone. I mean, she's gone. The, the, I honor the 20, the 30 year old for getting me to where I'm at right now. But there are aspects of her that I'm not going to be able to take fully with me, you know? And there was this deep understanding because I had never really even thought about that before. But for some reason, all those thoughts and all those feelings came rushing in at that moment. And it was, I mean, and, and I was, it, it took me a moment though. It took me a moment to identify, oh, it's like, this is what letting go feels like. Letting go, there's a deep grieving process. And I think that that's what, um, what can be surprising and shocking, but it's also a natural part of letting go. So if you are in the transitioning time and you feel like you need to cry, you know, or these overwhelming emotions come over that we're often surprised at how much of that is actually grief for having to, you know, in order to step into that new phase, to evolve, to ascend or whatever, um, to let go of those, be those pieces and parts that were a big part of your identity. That's huge. Cause I struggle with that big time. That's and you saying that like the first time I struggled with the aging process was my 27th birthday. And I didn't know at that point, that was my Saturn return. That's at most every, you know, it's common for, but that was the first time it like really hit me that I wasn't, you know, entering into your thirties. You're not really young and you're young, but you're not really young anymore. You, you, you know, and then of course I just turned 40. So that was really hard for me. Every birthday gets harder and you're right. Saying that is it's, it's like, I don't want to go back to my twenties. I don't even want to go back to my thirties, but there's an element of yourself in those decades that can't come with you into your forties because that's not the time. That's not the, the phase you're in. So that's so true. That's, I think a lot of, you know, and I think, I think that's why we see so much anti-aging everywhere, you know, of, of trying to, and I love that you said that about the, the being, and we talk about that a lot, the leaning into the pain and we, we've talked about po uh, toxic positivity within the spiritual community. Cause that's unfortunately you see that a lot. And yeah, when it's not so much, when you realize there's, there's a pain inside of you, it's not just letting it go. It's not going to work just to let it go. You, in right. order to let it go, you have to actually unpack it mm -hmm. and like live it and cry and like be in that state of mourning. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it, it's like a dish rag. It just rings it all out. And then all of a sudden you can, you can wish it bon voyage, you know, um, until next life, we will meet again next life. I'm sure, you know? So, um, mm -hmm. so Emmy, you want to go, did you find what you were looking for? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me share screen here. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So I like, I like the seven stages cause, um, there's just a little bit more there. Um, so shock and disbelief is typically what happens at first, you know, and we can use loved ones. Um, but like Cindy was saying, and, and I'm actually going through a grief process right now, similar to what Cindy Cindy was just describing, not, not for age, but, um, just another, another huge layer of the ego onion dying. <laughs> um, so shock and disbelief. And I actually had, um, an experience, a shocking experience, um, a little less than a couple weeks ago during a meditation. Um, just some, some things were shown to me, um, and it was just, I, I'm still trying to wrap my, my head around it. Um, and then the next, typically the next stage is denial. Like it's too, it's too much to wrap your head around um, moving forward into this next phase of life or, or thinking about having to live without someone who was 
really close to you. So we just, it, it's just kind of like this space that we enter um, that's maybe a little uh, safe, maybe gives us a little relief from the, the bigness of it. And then the next phase um, can be guilt and pain. And, you know, sometimes we feel guilty um, if we survived uh, someone. Sometimes we feel guilty um, that, you know, we're still here and this person isn't. And then the pain, you know, definitely felt in the heart space, but also can be felt in the body physically. Um, and then the bargaining stage where this is another kind of actionable step that the brain takes to kind of deal with the loss um, where you're trying to rationalize or just just try to make sense out of what is happening. Um, anger. There can be very, very intense periods of anger or even rage at the situation. You know, it's, you're not able to control what is going on and it can be really overwhelming. Um, depression. Depression is fairly common and typically is one of the stages that you're in for a longer period of time. Um, this can be the stage where we can turn to escapism or addictive substances or tendencies or, or addictive activities um, to just get away from it. You know, sometimes it can be so overwhelming and so uh, monumentous that we just need a break and it can be really easy to turn to things or substances or medication even and you know nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with um if you decide you need to to take medication for a short period of time I just encourage people not to come to depend on that um for your new normal going forward and then lastly is acceptance, um, where you come to a space where um, you are becoming more comfortable with who you are as a person going forward, either in this new phase of your life or without the job that you lost or without your pet um, or your family member. Um, and you can bounce around through any of these stages, like you could go through all the stages, be at a place of acceptance, and then all of a sudden one day just get really pissed about what it is that you lost, or go back into the sadness, or another, you know, phase of denial. It's definitely not linear. It's not like you go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, and it's nice and neat and even, and it's just not how grief recovery works. Um, yeah. And one thing I want to talk, I actually, because you kind of mentioned it, we spoke about this on the phone, another form of grief, you see this a lot in like intense spiritual work is the ego death. That's one of the biggest, biggest, most breathtaking forms of grief. That's why it's called the dark night of the soul. That's why it's called the ego death. And I was telling you, Emmy, Back in like 2017, um, there were, and I was teaching at Cindy Shala at this point, but there were like two months where I cried every single day. And I was, what I was mourning was, you know, we all know we're going to die one day. Like that's not, you know, we know we're mortal. But I had really was so focused on the philosophy of, of allowing myself to understand my soul that the reality of me as Bryce in the body and the life I live now, even though it becomes a chapter of my soul's existence, would not follow me after death. That after death, this identity, ashes to ashes. It's like putting on, you know, and we think about our clothes, right? Like you put on a different outfit every day and you don't really think much. I mean, you have your favorite shirts and it's a shame when they get lost or outworn, you know, but it's not something that's 
emotional about that. Like Sri Swami Sitananda and his commentary says, like, once you really go through the acceptance that you're a soul, then you can really enjoy your life because, you know, it's like a virtual reality game, basically. Right. It's just a simulation. But really, and, and again, this is not groundbreaking news. Like we all know that that death, you know, death be not proud. It's It's coming one day for all of us. But I think for some of us, like, or for me, like at that moment, just, and I had been studying this philosophy for a long time, but with my practice and really working on it and really trying to identify more with the watcher, the seer, and not the watchable, not the seeable, which is another definition of prakriti would be the seeable, the watchable, parusha is the seer, the watcher, trying to identify more with the watcher versus the watchable really put me in a, a really dark place of grieving just this life. And I started to think more about past lives, you know, and we have some recollections of past lives, but we don't remember the full extent of those lives. We don't remember the good days we had, the bad days we had, the loved ones that we loved and cared for, the the children we birthed in those lives, the, you know, and so uh, those are just distant, foggy ideas. So, then understanding that the next life I live, this life would also be a distant, foggy idea. And that was so hard for like two months, probably maybe even longer. I was, I was literally like crying every day. I mean, I, I feel sorry for my boyfriend. I'm sure I was not the sexiest at that time, but, um, you know, but, um, but it's, it's, it's morning. It's going, that's the ego death. It doesn't mean that the ego is permanently dead. It's not until it goes with the body, but, but just understanding what that was. And I hope that that makes some sense because I think a lot of people and it, and it passed, it did pass and it comes to acceptance and yeah, and then you're fine again. And then, you know, a year later, you might go through another bout of it. It just, it is, it's a pulling back of the layers. It's um especially when you are practicing a very potent practice that's kind of geared towards, towards those realizations you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I know you said that's something like you're going through right now, Emmy, it's hard, isn't it? Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> yeah. For about three months now, um, it, it started the beginning of December and <clears throat> it's like, it's another layer you know, I've been waking up spiritually since about 2016. Um, and this particular layer is just really deep, like what Bryce was saying. Um, I think it's A Course in Miracles. So... The daily lessons, yes, that. The daily lesson, there's 365 daily lessons. They're intentionally and specifically designed to unlearn the ego's thought system. It works, okay? <laughs> I'm just in a very, a very yin stage of my spiritual growth. And God keeps bringing these two analogies. I really hope this is helpful for people because this is really hard to do this on camera. Um, okay, so the two analogies were this. I have this vitamin powder. It's a superfood. Um, I wanted to switch my supplements up. So I, I am trying something different. And you take a scoop of powder and you put it on your water and it'll just sit there until you take a spoon and stir it up and mix it up and disturb it and, and make it all go crazy and haywire. And like the past three months, every time I take my vitamin powder, 
God keeps bringing to mind, you know, this is what's happening inside of you. This is what's happening with your nervous system in order for you to become, um, or in order for you to remember who you are, everything has to be stirred up and disturbed and, and, you know, mixed up and, and it's really uncomfortable. But if that really disturbing, uncomfortable thing doesn't happen, my vitamin drink won't mix with the water. So even though it is kind of disruptive and chaotic, it's still a beautiful part of the process. And the other analogy was um, like a tree. So in order for a tree's branches to reach higher and higher into the heavens, to grow wider and longer and taller, it has to reach its roots deeper and deeper and deeper into the depths. So as you're growing, you know, um, and reaching higher and growing higher, first, you have to be willing to reach really down and far down into the depths, you know, so, so as high as you're reaching up to heaven, you have to be willing to reach that far into hell. And <clears throat> I'm learning to detach from the feelings because, you know, I tend to think that when I'm feeling good, when I am, um, you know, vibrating high, then I'm doing well. And if I'm feeling bad and in this lower space, then I'm not doing well, but that's not the case. I'm doing really, really well right now. It's just really hard. It's just really hard. Um, that's a good thing to, to, to po uh, point out as well. We had a, a student years ago that did an ayahuasca ceremony. And when he came back in, we asked him, like, what's the biggest thing you learned? And he goes, I realized that joy, laughter, sorrow, depression are, are both the same. They're two sides of the same experience. They don't really dictate anything. And that's what uh, we talk about karma a lot in the yoga world or any spiritual world. And I think Westerners are really confused about what karma is. I'm actually about to do a huge video on it because I think people are so confused about this. All karma is, is action and reaction, cause and effect. That's it. That's all it is. And if you get into like spiritual works, it, the spirit has no attachment of whether something you label something is good or bad by your attachment to the outcome of the experience, right? Karma, it, take it down to biological stuff. You drink a glass of water. What's the karma of that? Well, you're hydrated but then you're going to have to pee. That's karma. You woke up this morning because that's the karma. That's the effect of going to bed last night. All right. You know, and, and there's different, you know, it, it's, it's obviously gets deeper and more profound, but karma also provides that friction. So the attachment we do have to the cause and effect is what causes things like grief is what causes these experiences for us to have. So that we can go into the depths of hell, as you said, like, <laughs> listen, if you want to be a spiritual person, you're going to have to get real comfortable with hell. You gotta, you're you going to have to buy some lakefront property in hell because that's <laughs> where you're going to spend most of your time, right? You know, it's, 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 um, cause it's, it's having to look at that. I mean, I know Cindy is kind of like, that's kind of your forte is working on that shadow side and that darkness and you know, the, the matter of it all, the Shakti of it all is that creation. It's, it's, um, it's that, that um, idea that our soul and in, in its infinite wisdom created this simulation in order to, one, use... of, the, one of the favorite things that one of my teachers said is um, we don't necessarily come into uh, embodiment because uh, we want to know our oneness because we were we're already that if you if you believe in a soul and, and you and you believe that in that purusha you know we're already that we we came here to know more than uh just our oneness we came to know the full spectrum that's the whole reason for embodiment and it was funny too because uh, i posted something on instagram and it was something that we were talking about in class last week 
where we were talking about the, uh, and I put a, a, the picture of the Nataraj that you gave me, Bryce, the Nataraj, which is the dance of Shiva. You know, Shiva is the cosmic dancer. And uh, um, the Nataraj shows, uh, it, it beholds Shiva going through his five main activities. And his five main activities, which is also our, our five main activities, because we're also the cosmic dancer. You know, one of them is creation. So he holds a drum in one hand that represents creation. He holds a um, fire. There you go. He holds fire in another hand, which is dissolu uh, dissolution. So there's creation and then there's destruction or dissolution. And then um, the other hand, he holds uh, like this in that Abhyaya Mudra, which represents preservation. All right. So we go through these phases, right? Ourselves of creation, dissolution preservation. And then the one foot, you can see how that one leg is coming down, standing on the, the little uh, dwarf demon. That leg coming down on that dwarf demon represents when we go through phases of forgetfulness and concealment. So it's part of our dance. So we are, we go through the process of forgetfulness and conceal where we, we, we're concealed, we forget our truth. But then you see the uplifted leg, the one that's lifting up, that leg represents um, remembrance and revelation. So yes, we go through concealment when we go through embodiment, right? We're born with that forgetfulness. But then that other leg represents, ah, but there's these moments of grace of revelation when we remember. But it's all part of the dance. You know, we need all the motions. And then the other hand, there's another arm that's going across like this. And it points down at that foot that's lifted. And what that hand represents is, hey, if you get stuck, you get stuck in forgetfulness, look down there at that foot, the foot that's lifted up and remember that that's where the grace is. Like, remember the step of revelation that that is coming, right? So we will all go through the phases of creation, destruction. You can't avoid it. We'll all go through the phases of concealment. But luckily, we come through the phases, we, we, we go through that phase of remembrance and revelation. And that's what that hand points to. It's like, remember that that's also coming. And that this is all just part of the dance. We are the cosmic dancer. We're going to go through that whole entire, uh, the, that, that whole entire, um, all those motions ourselves. And he's dancing in that ring of fire. See the, the ring of fire that goes around and that represents Maya. It represents us being born into this, uh, into this, into this form. And his, his dreadlocks are out like this. And that represents him being in constant motion. In other words, he's swinging his head around like this in constant motion. And so are we. And luckily we're always moving and dancing and changing. So we're, we'll go through all these different phases ourselves. So if you are stuck in like grief or depression and you're in a moment where you are concealed and maybe you're in a moment of forgetfulness, we all go through it. Know that uh, the revelation is coming and look for the grace in the present moment. I love that. And that's what I, I love about Shiva so much in a lot of the Hindu mm -hmm. deities is because Shiva is actually, he's one of the triheads that the, 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 there's Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, the, the, the Godhead, the, like, the, like Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they have Shiva, Vishnu, um, Brahma. But um, Shiva, even though he has the Nataraj, the ring of fire, where it's this hectic, chaotic life, Shiva's also like the pothead. And the, the, <laughs> the, the deity that meditated for what, a thousand years? So there's this like calmness to Shiva as well within the hecticness of the, I, I always think about that when I look at the Nataraj, like this hectic, beautiful chaos, the entity that's doing this within him is also this, 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 this calm, like he represents the Tamas Guna, which is the Guna, the line of energy within us that's real like relaxed, right? And so within you is that, I mean, listen, if you ever go to India for Shiva Ratri, you will never have mm -hmm. to buy marijuana. You'll just get secondhand high because that's what they do <laughs> at Shiva Ratri. 
you know, it's um, it's uh, uh, one of my boyfriend's teachers told him once because uh, he he likes his his uh, Shiva Ratri. We'll just say it that way. And she goes, you know, even Shiva had his limits. Like you got to stop at some point. Oh, so, yeah. but that's what I love. That's why I love about the. There's so many multifaceted uh, the the deities, the representations, the avatars of God, and that's what I love about the Nataraj too. Is that when you know that this this is the Shiva in this this like chaotic beauty, but Shiva's also the deity of calmness. And he's also the warrior too. I mean, that's why Ganesh has an elephant head. Shiva freaked out and cut the kid's head off and then went, oops, let me go and replace that and put an elephant head. I don't know if you guys know that. Ganesh is just an elephant head. The rest of the body is human. So, um, so you know, so it's showing that polarity within us as well, which I guess mm-hmm. is the two feet too, you know, the two feet of, um, and I, what and I love about- Concealment and revelation. Yeah. Embodiment and, and then uh, your, your, your humanity and your divinity as we often say it too. And isn't that just the, we talk a lot about opposing forces because that's what creates friction. I know that's spoken about a lot in Ashtanga. I speak about it a lot in my class. And, you know, you think about the physical body when there's an opposing force, there's a stretch and there's a heat that comes from that. But what's, what's more opposing forces than having a mortal body with an immortal soul? You can't get more opposing mm-hmm. forces than that. Like within that, with that within itself is a friction, right? And, and, you know, I know, I mean, for me, like when I was going through my realizations, I remember, I actually remember I was on Juniper, which is the street up here, big street in Atlanta. Um, And I remember where I was when I had this thought. And I thought if I could remember all of my past lives, if I was in my soul, my, just my spirit body and God came to me and opened up this closet and I saw every body, I, every single incarnation I had lived in just kind of hanging on a hanger. And God said, you can be any one of the lives you've been forever and ever and ever, which one would you pick? And I remember thinking, I don't even know if I would pick this life because I can't remember those, which one was the greatest life, you know, Mm -hmm. which body did I enjoy the most? I don't know. And that realization in itself broke me because I thought, wow, everything, but it's not a distant memory really, because the soul always carries the information. It's just like that Shiva Ratri or the, um, the Nataraj, like going into that forgetfulness, that necessary forgetfulness. Um, and I think it's also important to take into consideration what your body is going through in the, uh, through any kind of the grieving process. I mean, it's a for real physical thing. Um, there's a, a, a great book that I've uh, recommended to a lot of my clients, people that I've worked with who have gone through anything like divorce or whatever, you know, anything where there's been the uh, breaking apart like that, um, or, you know, a, a loss in relationship or any, it could be anything, um, but it's a book called Journeying from Abandonment to Healing. And what I love about this book is that she describes the a lot of the physiological things that are happening through your body, how it hits your nervous system. And she says, like, when you first get the, uh, I think in this case, she was talking about, uh, in the book, she talks a lot about divorce or the ending of relationships. And when you first get that hit, you know, and how deeply abandonment is tied to the grieving process, how grieving often brings up these feelings of abandonment that they're 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 intertwined right when you get abandoned grief comes in yes this one uh yes and she calls uh she kind of goes through phases but it's a little bit different than the grief phase but what she talks about the first phase that we go through she calls it the shattering so when something happens you we all go through this shattering process And I love the way that she describes it um, where, and that's exactly what you feel like. You feel like you've been shattered in a a million different pieces. Uh, The things, especially like for women, for instance, um, how it's deeply, and it's not just uh, women that feel it, but, you know, men, obviously, because she gives a lot of examples of men who go through it. But one of the physiological things tied with women is um, back a long time ago, our ancestors, if you were a woman and you were abandoned by your tribe, that meant death for you. 
And so there's a remembrance of that in your body, in your DNA. So when you go through like the shattering period, it brings up all this, those fears, like deep, deep fears about um, I'm going to die. Your body, your body is actually thinking that it's going to die. That's what your body is responding to. When you go through like moments of grief, your, your body is thinking that it's going to die. And that's why your central nervous system just goes into this like crazy upheaval because it's like preparing for death. And, but the understanding of, oh, you know, my, my body is having this physiological response, you know, all of this, uh, these hormones are going off and it's causing me to feel this way even more. I don't know. I just think sometimes when we understand the physiological stuff that's going in our bodies, that it can also help us to get through those moments of grief of like, oh, I mean, I, cause you can't help it because you know, when that happens, you can't help it. And you might want to try to stop it and do all the things that you can, but it's just your body's going to do what your body's going to do. <laughs> and when I think we, we can understand those, uh, like the shattering that we go through and uh, that that's like a, like truly a real thing and that you're not going crazy, that we can then at least respond with some understanding and compassion toward ourselves when we're going through those kind of processes. I like that, the shattering, because I think there's mm-hmm. so many, as you were saying that, you know what I was thinking, Cindy, I was like, man, psychopaths have it so much easier. Right. They don't have to feel nothing, right? They're like, whatever. <laughs> right. So you left me. I'll find another one, you know? Um, and mm-hmm. I, think, I think that that deep feeling of pain just shows how deeply you love too you know right. where there's darkness there is i mean that's one thing the law of one also says about planet earth because you know planet earth is one of the most most uh gangster planet darkest planets third density planets out there like we take the darkness real seriously here we go to depths that other planets won't go to but the law of one always reminds you that because there is so much darkness on this planet there's also that much light there has to be the balance mm-hmm. there's more light here than any other planet well when the, when shadow comes up there has to be the light that comes up that can oppose it yeah yeah um, and that's and um, dark things begin to emanate the light also has to come up so there's a force that can come in and uh and it goes the other way around too when there's a uh, um i can't remember what book i read but they were talking about how people who shine really 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 bright that they also have they cast a really big shadow Hmm. and they 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 have lots of that experiences in their lives if you think about some of the great movie stars that cast the beautiful big huge bright light if you think of the legends the people that you remember they also had a like that sh- that opposing shadow so it goes both ways if you have a, sh- a shining bright light then you're gonna have a pretty big shadow that comes <laughs> with it too oftentimes so yeah more than likely Everyone's like, next life, God, can I just be me to, me to, me to core? Like, just, just put me like, just very easy. Um, yeah, just let me be medium. Medium, just medium. I just want medium life. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, yeah, and it's, it's it, but I mean, it's so hard. And I know Alan Watts and Sri Swami, she, they, all, they both kind of said the same thing. It's like once that realization that the pain is going to come, you can ride the waves of the pain in a different way when you're able to understand that the pain is part of the experience. You know, it's, it's, um, it's part of that, that simulation of, of being that, that you co-created. Um, God, I'm thinking like, I'm sitting there thinking our souls must be like in the cosmic, uh, insane, insane asylum. <laughs> we must be, we must be cos- cosmically one floor of the cuckoo's nest, but you know, it's, <laughs> And it's hard and it's, um, I'll never forget. There's a book, uh, what's it called? The Secret Life of Bees, I believe is the name of the book. I read it a long time ago. Uh, my first grade teacher's husband's sister wrote the book and um, it, they made a movie out of it. it. Takes place in South Carolina in like the fifties. And there was a family of sisters of, of, of black sisters. And of course this is a time period and they end up taking in this little white girl that is without a family. But one of the sisters is very emotional and she had her own little wall that she would go to whenever she would feel pain 
our sadness, she would like write things on a note and stick it in the wall and go there to cry. And I remember I said to someone once, like, I really want that wall. Like, I think that wall is because it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a place where she would go to express that pain when she needed to, it was acknowledging that pain. And then the person looked at me that I said this to as a guy I dated, he was like, why do you think you need that wall? And I was like, don't you therapy, don't you therapy me? Like, I just think that's a really good idea to actually have a place where you can go and ignore. I think he was a little psychopathic, if I'm going to be completely honest. So, mm -hmm. so, but for me, that was a really good idea, like to have a place where one could go to actually acknowledge the pain, where you could physically remove yourself from a situation and acknowledge it and have a sacred place out in the yard at her little wall where that could be expressed. And how healthy is that? And I think for a lot of us, that's what our practice is. It is our wailing wall. It is our wall of tears that we go to our yoga mats or our bar classes or our running shoes in order to have a place to, as Marnie Alton says in her classes, we feel things here in order to have mm -hmm. that sacred place to feel. I mean, I've seen more people cry in the yoga room than I have anywhere else in my life. And some of the st people who appear to be the strongest will one day just be a heaping mess on their mat. And, you know, usually we, we don't draw attention to it. We just let them do their thing. We don't draw attention to it, you know, and have their moment. And, um, well, anybody yeah. that you look up to, like they're a hot mess. And so it's one, of uh, another teacher that s says that, that everybody that you've ever looked up to, they're a hot mess somewhere in their lives. <laughs> I mean, and the, and and I read that too here recently. Like there was this really there's this person, you know, he's really successful, you know, whatever successful means to you. And he was even saying, Do you ever just feel like a failure someday? Today is one of those days for me. And you know, then that's coming from someone who is, you know, highly successful. And you think, oh, well, these highly successful people who've got it all together. They have days, probably several days, where they feel like failures or, you know, they feel like they're just things are happening. They, they feel like a hot mess. And you, it's, it's just part, I guess it's just understanding that it's part of the part of the process, no matter how successful you are, no matter how high performing you are. You know, it's we're we're all going to go through those moments. And I guess what our practice really does is it helps uh lifts us up more quickly so that we don't spiral and stay down there without any realization of the good that can come to the uh, other side of it i think that's what our our practices help us more so with that than from keeping us from having the feelings because the feelings are going to naturally come and go but how long we stay there and how long we believe it that is where your the efficacy of your practice comes in. It helps you get through those moments so you don't stay there as long. And I think that's what the, you know, the 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 the, the high performers or the 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 ones who shine bright, uh, and they can kind of stay there. That's what they've figured out more than anything. It's not that they avoid feeling bad. It's that they have processes and routines and things in their lives that help uh, help get them through process it and that's so true I mean mm -hmm. I was thinking some of the greatest I mean I know going to, I mean I always tell people like the best thing you can do for your yoga practice is to go to India and watch all these famous yoga teachers that you think have all their shit together well let me tell you as beautiful as their practices are their lives are usually pretty falling apart you know every mm -hmm. you know and so but it's 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 there isn't yeah it's it's um 100 it's uh how many people who are high powered attorneys that have all this money and this success in the courtroom have five divorces behind them and you know it's 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 mm -hmm. it, it is there's nobody as my as my one of the most profound things my algebra teacher said in high school was no one gets out of this world alive i've that's the <laughs> one thing i held on from algebra two that's that no one gets out of this world alive that's it that's the one thing um and without feeling something without going through some element of suffering yeah yeah, it's everyone's gonna everyone's gonna hit somebody it's gonna hit you at some point oh I you absolutely know, than others you know some people are born with more having to go through more of that than others but it's gonna hit everybody nobody gets away with not 
coming into embodiment without feeling the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's funny. The law of one also talks about how we, when we, when we're designing our, you know, I kind of see it like you're planning your college courses, like with your advisors, like you're picking your classes and the law of one will advise people sometimes that they put too much, you know, because we as spirits see our life here on earth is so quick that we want to throw all these experiences in just to get through it. And then our, our higher ups are like, listen, you don't need to get raped five times, go through a bankruptcy, have 10 divorces. Like you don't, your nervous mm -hmm. system, they have to pull us back sometimes from, from all the experiences that we truly want to have in order. And, and as uh, the loved one says to refine your soul, it's your soul refining itself, you know? And so, yeah, that is true. No one gets out of this world alive. We all have our crosses to bear. We all have, um, have to go through and grief is like I, I think that just is is a theme that kind of weaves in and out a lot of of a lot of suffering regardless of whether it's losing a loved one regardless of whether it's losing a job or, you know whatever a divorce uh getting older it, it can it comes in in so many different I mean miscarriages I've never had a miscarriage but I know women that go through miscarriages apparently that's just an incredible grieving process you know it's um it's they say even moving like when you move house to house that it go mm -hmm. it's like you're going through the process of a death almost and and you could be I mean I want to move from where I live right now because this place is old and you know it was just it's we I need to find somewhere else in the area but I, even though I want to get out of this place, I know it's I'm going to cry the day it happens because there's great memories that have happened. You know, it's it's that giving that up and, um, you know, it's uh, it's and that's that sensitive. It's that tender. I think the more we grieve, the more our heart is really tender. And it's mm -hmm. that love. You know, that's the opposite is that it's showing the love like Emmy going through the ego death. It's showing the love you have for your life. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know where my warning was before I came here because <laughs> I lost my whole family of origin within a decade I've been through divorce I've had miscarriages I've moved five times like what was I thinking <laughs> you're like I want to speak to the manager where's the manager <laughs> don't let me do this next life <laughs> like we're gonna get before I come back up into my higher self while I'm in my lower self I'm gonna let y'all know right now, stop me next time. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, it's it that's rough. And but honestly though, Emmy, and I know this about you, it seems to me people in my life that I know have had a rough go at it are some of the kindest, wisest, most grounded, most loving humans I've ever met. And so I'm that's why like you you're going through the, but that just shows the way the fact that you're grieving shows that there's also love there. And that's what's causing the grief is that feeling of love. What's the opposite of that would be a psychopath where you feel no love. What's that saying it's better to love and and to love and have lost than to never loved at all? Mm -hmm. You know, it's so all this um very Saturnian. This is the this is the Saturnian part of life, you know, where when you're talking about astrology. Saturn is somewhere. Saturn is always somewhere in our lives, right? And it's exactly here. And, and that's what I feel that this is the it's it's the what doesn't kill you make you stronger. That is Saturn's Saturn's catchphrase. <laughs> and it's also what you were saying. Um, where on the other side, where you're, you're talking about Emmy, how she's wiser and kinder and sweeter, more compassionate from him. Those are those Saturnian lessons where when you go through the deaths and the grief and you go through all these these hardships that come into your life, those Saturnian, I mean, we none of us really love to think about Saturn, like you were talking about Saturn return and all that. But when you get through it, those are the things that it's alchemy. It, it's changed you from the inside out and you're a different person by going through those processes. And that is why Saturn is a great elder. He's a great elder planet. And that's what I know both Cindy and, and um, 
Emmy are two women that I know personally don't hold a lot of judgment towards other people. And that's a huge lesson of love when you're able to, you know, walk through the fire of life and you come out and you don't judge people as much because you have that compassion because you've been there yourself and you know how easy life can, life can change. I mean, look, listen, I mean, have you guys actually sat back and thought in 2020, they shut down a whole planet? Like, have you actually, I mean, the reality of right. what just overnight, I mean, that, 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 that didn't teach you how quickly things can change. I mean, I don't know. I, I know people from 2020, there's probably a lot of grief that's happening from that domino effect of that happening, whether it was losing your business, all this kinds of stuff that, that happened, um, the political divide, you know, that's, people are grieving that. If they allow mm-hmm. themselves to actually say, you know what, a lot of us lost friends because we mm-hmm. didn't follow the narrative, you know, and, and to say that really sucks. And I miss those people, even though they didn't, you know, it's okay to, to, you know, you don't have to be, again, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions people have about spirituality is that it's just, even the half Thors, I did my reading for next week already. And they talked about um, hanging out in the clouds too much. You will not ascend. They basically said that you will not ascend unless you ground yourself unless you you're willing to actually implant yourself into your own hell. And I think that's so important because we, there are people who try to avoid, they think that spirituality is hanging out in the clouds and butterflies and rainbows. Listen, Mm -hmm. no, I I always compare it. Like, you know, in Ashtanga Shala, you walk in and people have their pants on backwards, eyeliner running down their face. They have Albert Einstein hair. I'm like, that's that's messy and that's what that's what it really looks like you know it's it's uh it's there's their top and bottoms don't match you know it's it's just that but that's re- but it's real um mm-hmm. it's uh there's a and then and then, and then on the other side of that too though there's uh the beauty you know there is beauty when you descend you ascend the ascension yeah. is there too and that, I think that's what that uplifted leg, right, of the yeah. Nataraj is, is pointing back to that, is remembering that this will this too shall pass. So when you're going through those grieving processes or whatever you're going through, some shadow period or a phase of concealment or forgetfulness, that, um, that it's going to pass and there's some sweetness and goodness that's a, uh, that's there too. I mean, it's just there. The sweetness and goodness and all the beautiful things are, are there. The sun's still shining. The birds are still chirping. You know, the the fruit trees are still creating oranges, and the apple trees are still creating apples. You know what I mean? It's like the yeah. every the world is still moving through its beauty, and and we just went. We're just going through a moment of dark. maybe humanity goes through it collectively. Sometimes we go through it individually. But the world, it's still shining on, you know, the sun's still shining, the, 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 you know, other babies are being born all the time. And, um, and I think we just got to remember that, you know, that that's, that's happening too. And that in itself, actually, I mean, I've never had a child, but um, both of you have, and like, let's, I mean, grief in that postpartum depression, Mm -hmm. you have this beautiful baby that you would give your life for, but in the same token, a lot of women are also struggling with grieving. Being a mom. My postpartum depression. I'm sure you probably had it too, Amy, but I know my postpartum. I only have, I've only had one kid. He's a, he's 17 year old now, but it lasted a good two and a half years. And I didn't even know I was in it until I was out of it. You're like, you oh. know, then I look back and I'm like, oh shit, that's what that was. No wonder I was feeling like shit. Mm -hmm. you get caught up in it you don't even know so many (laughs) women so many women so many of my friends my sister like after having their first child and the doctors like hand you a baby and you're like what do I do with it and then they send you home and you're like wait I'm I'm going through all these changes in my body for women you literally just had a you you shot something the size of a watermelon out a hole the size of a penny Mm-hmm. Your body went through hell and back to do that. You're, you know, I know a lot of women 
don't feel so great after having babies because it takes a while for the, the the body to bring itself back to its natural place. They don't feel sexy anymore. Now they're not their husband or boyfriend, sexy girlfriend, wife, but now they're mom. They're a mom now. And then I know for a lot of people, there comes a dynamic change with the husband or the boyfriend where all of a sudden the husband doesn't feel loved because the, the mom's giving the attention to the baby, which I know for men. So there's a grieving process for men as well. I know most men don't mean that in a negative way. It's just the relationship dynamic changes because now the two of you are responsible for keeping this little thing that looks like Winston Churchill, because all babies look like Winston Churchill, alive. And nobody gave you a manual on how to do that. Right? You got poop shooting out at you. I, you, I mean, the first time I changed my nephew's diaper, he shat all over me. Like, you know, things are happening. And, um, and that's, and that's a grieving process for, for people too, but there's such a beautiful, so there's that dichotomy, right? There's that polarity. Mm -hmm. You have this beautiful life that you literally would give your life for, but you're depressed about it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's the well, first thing to buy the hormones i mean the hormones too when they come up you know i'm a strong believer too that your hormones are just they pull up stuff that are buried and you know so we go through cycles even even monthly cycles or yearly cycles or whatever our hormones are doing and then sometimes we'll feel really great and other times we feel really agitated and other times we feel really sad but the hormones, I mean, they can really, um, they can, as far as the emotional stuff, the stuff that we're actually uh, carrying, the the baggage that we're carrying, the hormones, uh, I mean, they do a great job of showing you where the baggage is. And I think that's what happens a lot with the uh, postpartum depression. The hormones get so moved around that it's showing you where you've suppressed a whole bunch of stuff. And then it just comes up all at once in this most unfortunate time when you're trying to, to be happy and joyful with your kid, then all, so all your suffering from all your lifetimes have come up, <laughs> you know, in the midst of that. And you're like, holy shit. <laughs> I just love those, those like, women in labor when they're in pain they look at their husbands they're like you did this <laughs> just that anger <laughs> you did this to me you know and so but yeah so there's grief everywhere in life like there's always going to be grief there's always going to be that and it's okay I think that's the biggest thing I, I think we want everybody it's okay to have a day and I thank you Emmy for being vulnerable because that's that is and that and I think too, when we're able to come down into the depths of hell, you can't fake it when you're in the depths of hell. So the ego has to remove itself. And that's what's so beautiful about that is that there's truth there. And, and most, and people are going to look at that and watch you Emmy, and be like, I thank God I'm not the only one. The what's more human than that, you know? Yeah. And, this and is then just, just remembering the, the the physical component that if you are going through a grieving process, no matter if it's a deep one or, you know, it's a, well, whatever, um, to really just let it process through your body, to let the sacred waters flow, you know, because that's your body trying to cleanse, um, cleanse through some of the pain um to understand you know the how energy holds in the body where you got you know your root your muldahara so there's a lot of issues there with safety for women and men the womb space like really working and nurturing the womb space and affirming that your womb is not a place to hold fear and pain but your body is designed to process fear and pain but it's not really designed to hold fear and pain for long periods of time. When you hold fear and pain for long periods of time, and that's when, you know, things start to happen. You get sick or you get ill or, you know, you don't feel well, you're lethargic, you're tired, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so your body is not a place to hold. This is an affirmation I actually say a lot in uh, yoga classes during Shavasana. I'll have them say, your body is not a place to hold fear and pain. Your womb is not a place to hold fear and pain. Your heart is not a place to hold it, process it, but um, you don't have to hold it and don't be afraid of the process. Your body can handle the process. I guess sometimes we don't think that we can handle the process, 
but we've all survived so far through our processes. So, you know, we can handle the process, even though it might be painful, but what we can't handle for a long period of time is holding it in. Then things will start okay. to break down. We start hoarding pain. We're just hoarders, hoarding pain. Emmy, what do oh, you tell yeah. me? Whenever I'm stressed out or upset, what is it you tell me? You're a hundred, your track record is a hundred percent. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Through everything. Mm -hmm. So, and guys, I know we're a little bit over an hour now, but I, I really wanted to focus a lot on all that, that material of what grief is. And then as Cindy was saying, the body is in a place to hold it. So when you're moving through the exercise, when you're moving through Cindy's class, or if you're a runner, whatever it is you're doing, allow the exercise, the fire of the exercise to process, um, especially when you're working through the hips. Um, if, if emotions come up when you're in a hip opener, that's normal. First of all, you're not crazy. That's <laughs> kind of the point. That's kind of the point of it. Um, yay. That's the point. <laughs> um, so, um, and just lean into it. And I know Shanti says this a lot. Ask it, what, it, what is it, what is, what is it here to teach you? So when grief comes up, hi, what's that Simon and Garfunkel song? Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've mm. come to speak with you again. Hello, grief. Good to see you again. What are you here to teach me now? What do you want to show me now? Hello, anger. What are you trying to show me? What am I not seeing? And when you start that dialogue with your emotions, trust me, your emotions don't want to hang out there. They want to go too, right? So they will talk back to you. They will let you know. Subtly, they will let you know what it is that they are trying to teach you and show you. So, Emmy, do you have any parting words for our awesome viewers? Um, I think for me, one of the most difficult things with grief is that I had this very irrational um, belief, subconscious belief that if I allowed myself to feel that it would kill me. And, um, you know, I didn't realize that I had that belief until I actually decided, okay, I'm going to allow myself to feel this. And I leaned into it and I, I allowed myself to feel like the full extent of the emotion that was coming up. And this beautiful thing happened. Well, A, I didn't die. Um, <laughs> And B, it came to a peak and then it, it passed and there was this incredible peace that took its place. And it's like, oh, okay. And it just, I just had to come to a point where um, it was inescapable. It was like, I either have to feel this, allow it to flow through me. Or it's just going to keep knocking at my door and I'm going to be miserable for Lord knows how long. Um, so, and I, and I think that this can be really difficult, more so difficult for men, um, you know, because typically the only acceptable emotion for men to have is anger. And so I think a lot of men have anger issues because, you know, that's what's acceptable. You see a little boy crying and a lot of time they're parents or caregivers will be like, come on, toughen up, you know, or um, don't be a sissy or some something along those lines. Even well-meaning um, people will say things uh, to, to children, especially boys um, along those lines. And so, you know, if you're a man, if you're watching this, um, you have stuff coming up, just allow it, just allow it, you know, go smash bottles over a cinder block or you know if you have a safe space to punch a hole in the wall do that or um you know just go somewhere and yell and cry and just let it out you know it's okay it's okay to do that stuff punch a pillow scream in a pillow do something you know ex express yourself in a healthy manner but express it you gotta let it out or it's just gonna keep building the, the thing that triggered me 
that gave me this realization that I am in this grief process was this meditation from um, one of the classes in my A Course in Miracles Academy. And they had you walking down a stairway into your heart space. And I, as I, I was watching myself walk down the stairway into my heart space, and when I got into my heart space, there was this endless sea of carnage and death and blood and guts and beasts. And I got the, I got down in there and I'm like, what is this? I was so confused and it was so shocking. Um, I had to turn my camera off in the class and I started crying and I cried uncontrollably for two hours. And what God was showing me was that all of the trauma and the stories of this character, I was holding it. I'm holding it in my heart space. And it makes sense to me because my, my arms and my chest and my upper back is where I carry all of my extra weight. And I've struggled with that for a very, very long time. So, you know, this stuff is just, just very eye opening. Um, so if it comes up, just allow it. If you've, if you're in a place that doesn't feel good, know that that doesn't matter. Don't attach to it as being bad, or you're not far enough along yet, or um, you're not where you're supposed to be. You know, uh, ascension is not linear. It's a spiral. And you go, you have these periods of up and you have these periods of, of down. And, and if you, if you feel like you are in the depths, just know that your roots are growing deeper so that you can grow taller and reach higher into heaven. So, yeah. If you're going through hell, don't stop. Keep going. Well, that's what Winston Churchill, speaking of Winston Churchill, he said, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> and it's like, I have to, you know, it's there is that beauty it's like the alchemist of Paulo Coelho where he goes on his journey from Spain to Egypt to find his treasure and he gets to Egypt and he realizes his treasure is back in Spain which is all a metaphor that it's in us all the the whole time and he goes through these whole things before he gets to Egypt and he's all frustrated like god why why did you send me to Egypt you know my my personal treasure is back at home and god goes but weren't the pyramids beautiful mm -hmm. Like enjoy it, just enjoy. There are there are sides of hell that are really beautiful. I <laughs> enjoy it, you know. Um, be there in that humanly moment. And Cindy, do you have any closing words? I'm gonna read a little something when we close off. But Cindy, do you have any parting words for all of our? No, I think I left it with the whole body thing. Yeah, and it's just just reiterating, yes, that let it process. And your body's not a place to hold but it. Give yourself permission to to feel what you need to feel and you're not going to die is yeah. Listen, that would if, be you feel. Feel. if you, if you feel something, if feeling something in a yoga class kills you, that's really bad marketing for us. So <laughs> 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 just keep that to yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of that being said, guys, even though we have links on the shadow work for Cindy's class, um, I am going to, you can look on our YouTube channel for some of her yoga classes, but I will put the sacred garden yoga website in the description box as well. And just like some of you guys take my class on Sundays, you can take Cindy's class too. So if you want to sign up and take one of her in real life classes virtually, um, if you don't live in Georgia, if you live close to Atlanta or Marietta, you can always come in for a class. We've got a few students that came in through this channel, so that's awesome. Um, but you can always take her virtual class as well. Just remember we're on East Coast time, so calculate that according to where you are in the world. But I wanted to read this. This came up today. We're doing the Sophia Code on Solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa, and something told me just to read this last part of Chapter 4, this last paragraph. May you receive our radical love, empowering the divine feminine Christ consciousness awakening within you. So the light of Sophia may shine a thousand suns over your sacred heart. It's always your sovereign choice to receive our support. Thank you for opening your heart and allowing, it makes me emotional, and allowing us to serve you. And that is, how does the heart open? It gets opened by being cracked open. The more my heart cracks, the more it breaks, the more the light can shine through. And so you guys got this. And if it gets to the point where something is really overwhelming, please reach out for support. I've been very honest. I've gone through trauma therapy. I freaking love trauma therapy. Listen, when I ended trauma therapy, I didn't want to go. 
I was like, no, I'm not healed yet. Let's keep going. <laughs> Cause eventually therapists will say, you're good now you can go. I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I want to keep coming back. Ther- therapy is awesome. Um, of course, Emmy and Cindy are both Reiki masters and there's um, obviously a lot of natural other healing. So if, if you're not comfortable with therapy, there's so many other resources out there. Um, a lot of you guys are in the signal group. You're welcomed. If you're not in the signal, signal group to join where there's just people in there that you can sometimes you just need a friend to talk to sometimes you just needed like tell a stranger who's your friend a gazillion miles away what's happening so that you can start to release that and so that's an incredible support group I love everyone in there so um there's so many resources out there I'm going to put the book that Cindy recommended as well I'm going to put the link to that in the description box too so um all right ladies thank you so much Thank next you. time we're gonna talk about no just kidding <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about parties things next time no <laughs> um i think this is an incredible episode and if, if our if our viewers watching want to join this round table discussion if there's any thing you want to add in the comment section stuff you've been through stuff that helped you process then let us know you know we're, we're as ram Dass says we're all just walking each other home so mm-hmm. all right you guys well i'll talk to you soon bye everybody bye